When the war ended and the reunification of the country began, Louisiana was poised to play a prominent role. Louisiana is an outlier during Reconstruction because there's a pre-existing, educated, black class here who are already prepared to participate in government when Reconstruction occurs. In 1868, Pierre Landry became the first African-American mayor in America when he was elected by the citizens of Donaldsonville. In 1872, Louisiana became the first state in the Union with a black governor. Welcome back, Louisiana. The year is 1873. As you know, our carpet-bagging governor, Henry Clay Warmoth, has been impeached. Live in studio now is his replacement, the first governor of African descent in American history, PBS Pinchback. Governor, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure being governor of Louisiana. How long were you governor? 35 days, but it felt like a lifetime. You know, a lot of people don't realize that in addition to being the first black governor of Louisiana, I was lieutenant governor, uh, I was elected to the U.S. Senate, and I founded Southern University. I see that nice mug. It feels to me like people should know more about your contribution to Louisiana history. <laughs> I couldn't agree more. I'm kind of a big deal. Uh, we're getting breaking news right now from former Governor Warmoth. Uh, we may have to cut this interview short, Governor. <laughs> it's quite all right. I'm used to impossible moments of transcendence in, in tiny increments. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The legislature has dropped its impeachment charges. That's the news. It looks like we may have Mr. Warmoth coming in on tape. His reaction, maybe it's an apology, maybe it's uh, kind words for his temporary replacement, Governor Pinchback. All right, settle down, settle down. Now, I don't pretend to be honest. I only pretend to be as honest as anyone else in politics. And that ain't very honest, is it? But you don't mind. You'd vote for a knapsack of crawfish if it did what you told him. Uh, those words from Governor Warmoth. Governor Pinchback, any thoughts? <sighs> the arc of the moral universe is long, and it bends away from that man. Well, that's Louisiana for you. The successes of Reconstruction were short-lived, however. In the late 1870s, Jim Crow laws that enforce strict racial segregation are passed and enforced all the way through the 1950s. Irma Thomas remembers all too well what it was like to travel during that era. You started performing uh, during the segregated South. Yes. And the world has evolved a lot, but what, what was it like performing in those early days? We had to really travel with everything because none of the stations would let you pull in. Very few of them, all they would do is sell you gas. You couldn't use the bathrooms. You couldn't buy anything from the restaurants. So you had to be prepared. And I think some of my habits are still with me because I still travel with toilet paper in the car, paper towels. I keep soap. And that's out of habit. But you had to be on guard constantly during those times because of the segregation and the mindset of the folk during that time. It's raining. The irony of the whole thing was my audience became all white. After getting into the business professionally, maybe three years to predominantly black audiences, and when It's Raining came out, it was like all of a sudden I had a white audience. Louisiana played a pivotal role in the civil rights movement. In 1892, a light-skinned Creole New Orleanian, Homer Plessy, boarded a train for the singular purpose of sitting in a whites-only section and getting arrested on a trip to his hometown. The challenge to his conviction became the landmark Plessy v. Ferguson case, which enshrined the separate but equal doctrine in American jurisprudence. Earl Warren, the Chief Justice of the Until United it was overturned in the 1954 United Brown v. Board of Education decision. Separate educational facilities are inherently unequal. I'm here with the great grandson of the first cousin of a very familiar name in Louisiana history, Homer Plessy. And he was a light skinned black man who was it called upon, I guess, or chose to ride that train for the sole purpose of getting arrested. Yes, his complexion played a big part in it because he caused no confusion at the ticket office. But the biggest ticket is that 
it was a, it was, it wasn't a random act of civil disobedience. He didn't just step on a train and decide he was going to change things. The, the train station knew he was coming when he purchased that ticket right down the street, a couple blocks away. The conductor made sure he identified Plessy as a, a colored man. So he asked him, "Are you a colored man?" And he said, "Yes." And immediately the arresting officer steps in and arrests him. By that time, everybody on the train knows he's a colored person. So a mob could have formed within that time and hung him. But what happened was that the arresting officer was like his bodyguard. He hurried him off to jail to make sure he got to central lockup and he was booked in criminal district court quickly. So it was all part of the plan so that he could challenge the law all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court is where they really wanted to go. And, and the hope, of course, was that it, the ultimate decision of the courts would be that he had every right to ride the train wherever he wanted to sit. Uh, but that's not the way it, it turned out when that decision was rendered. Right. But I'm proud to say that when they attempted to accomplish their mission, they actually created a blueprint for civil rights activism throughout the 20th century because it was repeated over and over and over. Reverend T.J. Jemison, who pastored Mount Zion Baptist Church in Baton Rouge for more than 60 years, organized the Baton Rouge bus boycott, seeking integration of the bus system. When the buses show up, all the black riders simply turn their backs to the buses and refuse to get on. They also, importantly, organized a carpool of black people who own cars to pick up bus riders and take them to their jobs. Four days in, the bus company is willing to concede they're going to go broke. They cannot survive without the black riders. All of these things set precedent for the later Alabama bus boycott, because a lot of these tactics are copied. The successes of the civil rights movement paved the way for Ernest Dutch Morial to become the first black member of the Louisiana legislature and the first African-American mayor of New Orleans. <laughs> 